welcome to Discovering. Tonight we're learning all about skull taxidermy using dermestid beetles. When you have a large colony, you know, things like deer heads, bear heads, they can clean them within a day. A great benefit is that they're very, I would say, gentle on bone. They generally don't cause any damage. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night and it's time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover when you're a long-time lover of northern Michigan. People have been displaying skulls in their homes for hundreds of years, yet it is something that many hunters overlook as a trophy to proudly display. The most common skull you will see are European mounts done with whitetail bucks. But other harvested critters make for good decor as well. Last fall, after I harvested a black bear, I brought the hide to a taxidermist, which is a story for another day, and I brought this skull to El Cheapo Skull Taxidermy to be cleaned and whitened to display in my house. Dan of El Cheapo uses dermestid beetles to remove all the flesh from the skulls. Dermestid beetles have been used by museums, anthropologists, and taxidermists for decades to remove dead and decaying flesh from dead animals. It's really cool to see, especially in the time-lapse videos that Dan creates. And no, these beetles do not feast on living flesh like in horror movies. The scientific name of them is Dermestis maculatus. Um, there are several common names for them. They're a hide beetle, some people call them domestic carpet beetles. Basically, they're just an insect that eats flesh. But they're used for taxidermy, museum collections, stuff like that, because they're really efficient at cleaning flesh. They reproduce rapidly. They're easy to take care of. So when you have a large colony, you know, things like deer heads, bear heads, they can clean them within a day. So these are raccoon skulls, and they kind of show the process involved with cleaning skulls with domestic beetles. The first one is a raccoon head that has been fleshed, so just cutting some of the meat off just to sort and prep them for the beetles. The next one is a raccoon skull that is fresh out of the beetle, so it's still dirty, not clean at all. The following one is a skull that is only partially cleaned. When I bring them in, they're really stinky dirty, so I just soak them for a few days in soap and water to get some of the gunk off. Then they go into degreasing, which is sort of the primary step in really properly cleaning a skull. Um, there are a lot of different methods for cleaning skulls, ranging from ones that are generally considered to be not as good for the skull. They can cause damage. The most common one is boiling. A lot of people do that, boil them, clean the meat off. But boiling can be destructive. It damages the bone and it doesn't get the marrow out. So the marrow in the bone, um, we often just refer to as grease. So getting the grease out is called degreasing. That's a really important step because you can take all the flesh from the outside of the bone, but all that material still is within the bone. So if you boil them, whiten them, they may look good immediately, but over time, the marrow will actually liquefy in the bone and start seeping out, and you end up with a skull that's no longer white. They'll turn brown, yellow, and actually be a little bit sticky sometimes. This is a skull that's degreased and whitened. So this skull is actually in warm soap and water for about five months to get all of the marrow out of the bone. The soaking process will actually loosen the teeth, separate the lower jaws, sometimes some other bone, so they need to be reassembled. And once you reassemble them, they look like this finished raccoon skull. These are just some examples of skulls I've recently finished just a couple weeks ago. So this is a coyote, a red fox, a badger, a couple of raccoons, porcupine, beaver, a couple of river otters, and a nine-banded armadillo. I get skulls from all over the place. We obviously don't have a lot of 
armadillos locally. Uh, so that guy, I think, came from Texas. I'm definitely somewhere in the Southwest, right? Get a lot of that sort of thing. They're pretty common down there. I either have people send me and I clean them and return them, or I just buy the skulls, often from trappers, and then I clean them and resell them. These are examples of some deer. Most people usually don't want the lower jaw back with them. Usually they prefer them that way. They either like how they look better or they're easier to display on the plaque or mounted on a wall. I personally like all mine with their lower jaw. It's actually one my wife shot last year. They're nice if you like put them on a shelf. To me, I just like kind of having the entire picture of the skull. This one, I whitened the antlers. Um, I get a lot of questions about um, cleaning deer from early in the season, usually the youth hunt if they still have velvet on. Um, if the velvet's on, the dermestid beetles will strip the velvet off and what you end up with underneath is white bone. That's actually not what happened in this one. This one, I just whitened it and I need to stain it back to look as natural as possible which you can use various stains for. So like I said, there are various methods of cleaning skulls, um, boiling, some people boil and then pressure wash. You can bury skulls in the ground and over a long period of time, they'll be cleaned. Some people macerate, which is actually a pretty good method. It just involves soaking skulls in water until bacteria completely strip all the flesh off. But I use dermestid beetles, which is a great method and there are several reasons why. One is that they can clean skulls quickly. A really good fast cleaning colony can clean a deer or bear skull that's fleshed first um, in about a day. A great benefit is that they're very, I would say, gentle on bone. They generally don't cause any damage. If you have small delicate skulls, especially skulls with delicate nasal bones, they can cause some damage, but there are ways to alleviate that by like wrapping them in um, material that all the beetles can't make it through at once or only the small beetles can make it through. Um, the real benefits are that they're fast and effective and they're not damaging to the bone at all. So you know, within a day or two, you can throw in a deer or bear skull. The, de the beetles completely strip the flesh off and the bone's in great condition. Um, and then you can proceed to degreasing and whitening. My original colony came from someone on eBay probably over 15 years ago, and I've just kept the same beetles going ever since. They reproduce really rapidly. The females lay generally like two to five eggs a day. They hatch, they go through a bunch of molting processes as they grow larger, they pupate, and then turn into adults. Um, usually within, it's around six weeks or so is the general amount of time it takes for that to happen, and then they'll live as adults for four to six months. So once you have beetles, they're really self-sustaining if you keep the conditions for them correct. So the ones that look like beetles, those are the adults. The ones that look kind of wormy, those are the larvae. The larvae actually do 99.9% .9 of the cleaning. Uh, once they're adults, their job is pretty much just to make more beetles. It's the larvae that are growing, molting, um, continuing to grow and pupate. So they really need all the energy. So they do almost all of the cleaning. Dan keeps the beetles in a well-sealed shed where he can control the temperature and humidity and keep pests out. To keep the colonies going, there are a few sort of key ingredients. Um, you need to keep them warm. They generally like temperatures between 60 and 80 degrees. If you want them to clean efficiently, usually it's around 80 degrees. The warmer they are, the faster they clean. You need to keep them dry. They like low humidity, and low humidity also helps prevent them from getting certain pests, such as mites. Um, domestic beetles can um, get infestations of mites just like bees, honeybees will, and they'll completely decimate a colony. Um, usually if you get mites, by the time you see mites, you have maybe like within a week, they'll destroy your entire colony, which I've had a couple of times. But that doesn't happen in low humidity situations. So you keep the humidity low with air circulating. You try to keep them in an enclosure that prevents other pests from getting in, such as spiders, ants. So it's basically keep them warm, keep them dry, and keep them fed. Um, a lot of people like myself buy a lot of skulls, clean a lot of skulls for other people. So I always have meat for them to eat. Um, but if you run out, you can use roadkill, table scraps, anything like that. Some people even feed them dog food if they don't have anything else for them to eat. And they can go a couple weeks without eating. So um, you can really keep your colonies going with minimal food. So they're pretty easy to keep going as long as you keep their conditions right.
Here's a time lapse of Dan fleshing out my bear before going into the beetles. Cleaning something like a bear skull that someone brings in, I'll start out by fleshing it. If it has the hide on, I skin that. The beetles, if desperate, will eat hide, but they don't like to. They won't eat feathers or hair. So what I do is I skin everything, and then usually I take about a half hour per head for a larger animal to clean off as much meat as I can. That's all the meat off the top of the head, the tongues, the eyes. I take the brains out, then they can go out with the beetles. Right now, you can be thankful Smell-O-Vision never caught on in the 1960s, or else you'd get to experience it too. It's pretty much what you might expect rotting flesh to smell like. It's relatively not too bad because I keep the ventilation going, which helps keep the humidity down and also helps with the smell. Um, if you don't keep ventilation going, the smell is quite horrific. See, even the stink now is with ventilation going 24-7. I initially had the pipe going on like 40 feet behind the building, but you could actually smell it going down the driveway. So now it's about 150 feet out in the woods. Mm -hmm. Propane heater, just to make sure the building stays warm and then a light bulb in each colony, just in case the heater goes out, the light bulbs will keep them from um, freezing. If they freeze, it will kill them. Um, if they freeze for long enough, incandescent bulbs getting more and more difficult to find. So um, they're just um, appliance bulbs I have now and just, a hole for air to come in since I always had the ventilation going. So there's some circulation, but in the winter I keep the circular ventilation really low, in the summer I keep it really high. Yeah, initially before I had a good setup, I didn't have any ventilation. I just had them in a shed and the colonies did all right, but that's when I had issues with things like mite infestations. When my colonies are really big, um, people have said they're probably up to like 40,000 beetles per colony. Um, right now they're much smaller. I intentionally kept their temperature lower in the summer and didn't feed them as much because I didn't want to uh, get too much of a backlog of beetle clean skulls to finish cleaning. So they're on the upswing right now. I like to do that, keep them lower in the summer, then get them going in the fall because I start having deer and bear skulls come in that I like to have them clean within one or two days. A guesstimate of how many beetles per colony I have right now is maybe five to 10,000 and I have three colonies going. And here's a time lapse of the beetles having a party on my bear skull. Once they're finished with the skull, I put them up on the shelves like these ones, uh, just so any remaining beetles can crawl out in search of food. And after at least a few days on the shelf, then I put them in the freezer to kill any remaining beetles before bringing them back into the house or garage. At that point, I start the degreasing process. The degreasing process, which is probably the most important part of properly cleaning a skull, um, take a long time. And there are several different methods that are sort of accepted as the best or the safest way to properly degrease skulls. They're not very fast, which can be pretty frustrating. Um, but if you properly degrease, you end up with a far superior quality skull when you're finished. A good example of degreased versus non-degreased skulls. These are both rabbits, one's a snowshoe hare, one's a cottontail. They're both cleaned with domestic beetles, both whitened with peroxide, but this one was never degreased. This one was actually degreased in acetone for about five months, so it no longer has any of the marrow in the bone. So after whitening, it has stayed white and clean and it should stay so indefinitely, versus this one, which kind of turned yellowish brown. Still not a bad skull, but it's much nicer to have them that are properly cleaned. The most widely used method of degreasing is with soap and water. Um, most people use Dawn dish soap, and it just involves soaking the skulls in warm soap and water for a very long time. If you're lucky, some species that are easy to grease can be degreased in a few weeks. Um, most skulls I clean take usually five or six months Deer aren't too difficult, three to four months to degrease those, but some things like bears, pigs, hogs can actually take six plus months to degrease. So in these, you can see some where the skulls are whiter, the water's clear, those are being also degreased in soap and water, but they're pretty close to being finished. The ones in the dark water are ones I just started recently. And every usually few days, I'll take them out, dump out the water, put new soap and water in. 
along with dish soap. Ammonia can also be used. I sometimes use a combination of dish soap and ammonia. Other methods for some other skulls that people commonly use are acetone. The benefit of acetone is that, well, one, it's safe for skulls, not as safe to deal with as soap and water. But when you use acetone, the skulls generally don't fall apart or teeth won't fall out. So when I'm using acetone, it's usually for smaller, delicate skulls or for opossums, which are sort of an interesting skull to clean. So these are all opossum skulls soaking in acetone. And opossums are tricky because the bones in their skull don't fully fuse together like in most other species. So if you soak these in soap and water um, that's heated for three or four months, they'll actually completely fall apart and then you have to put them back together. And this is an example of a deer that is fully degreased but not yet whitened. You can see it actually looks pretty good the way it is, but some people like them a lot whiter, so we generally whiten everything, and I just use peroxide for that. And there are actually several different types of peroxide you can use. The most common one is just the regular brown bottle stuff you get from any store. That's 3%, so it's fairly weak. You can generally soak skulls a little bit longer in them. Other common proxies are, that are used are Clear Developer from beauty supply stores for actually whitening or bleaching hair or Bacquacil from pool supply places, which is a little stronger, it's 27%, so I dilute it down. Uh, but really for your money, it's the best option because you get really strong peroxide for a really reasonable price. So the small skulls, um, I just completely submerge because you can whiten the entire thing. Deer skulls, I put them in a tub with the antlers out so that the antlers aren't whitened. The antlers actually whiten really quickly and you can fix it by um, staining them, but it's best to keep the antlers out of the peroxide. Depending on the concentration, if it's a, a fresh batch that I do in half, around 12-13% peroxide, I'll usually whiten those for 12-24 to 24 hours. Um, peroxide is one thing that can damage the bone if the concentration is too high or if, you, or if you leave the skulls in for too long. Um, but generally at that point it's whitening pretty quick because it's a stronger concentration of peroxide. So strong peroxide up to a day and then you take them out and usually soak them in degreasing water again for a couple of weeks. Peroxide really isn't considered a degreaser, but it does help break up any fat that's left in the bone. So usually after whitening, I'll go back to degreasing for a little bit. Right. Besides cleaning skulls um, for customers, for myself, I often do a little bit of artwork with them. Um, so I get a lot of whole carcasses from trappers. I clean the entire skeleton and I make new things using turtle shells. That's called my little turtle creatures. I've made a bunch of them. Um, I don't have most of them anymore. These are just a couple that I've managed to hold on to. Mm -hmm. So this guy's a combination of red-eared slider turtle, a bunch of scapulas from looks like beaver and I think mostly beaver, maybe some raccoon, a mink skull, a gray fox skull, badger claws, beaver bones. And the other little guy is muskrat and map turtle. One of the interesting parts of skull cleaning um, is seeing a lot of variations in skulls and also a lot of abnormalities or past injuries that have healed um, or diseases that animals have had. Um, each skull sort of tells its own story. This is a raccoon. I'm guessing it was an abscess tooth, but it basically resulted in a big hole in the lower jaw and the lower jaw actually broke in half at this point and then rehealed. So seems like a pretty serious injury, but the animal survived and the bone healed back to where, pretty close to where it originally was. Let's tie it with a hole in his head that was healing. Mm. That's another one that had holes in it, coyote. But that's, it's either healed or currently like degrading. So whatever's doing that hasn't kind of killed it. That's a lower jaw from a deer that someone had shot. So that's the bullet healed into the jaw. You had those wonky deer that probably had an injury at some point hit by a car or something. So then the antlers grow wonky out of them. Um, you'll get skulls like that sometimes where the adult, uh, adult teeth are coming in and the baby teeth are still in. So they look like they have double uh, canines. So that's a little bobcat. That is a one-eyed snapping turtle. So the eye should be that big on that side, but it was missing its eye. So the it's socket had healed. Um, this otter lost the canine. So one of the cool things is jaw bones heal over when you lose the teeth. So I'd lost the canine at some point. So there's just a healed spot there. I mean, they get crazy injuries that they survive. That's a raccoon where the atlas and axis were actually fused together and fused to the back of the skull. And that is a skunk. So members of the weasel family, primarily skunks and mink, get nematode. 
infestations in their nasals. Mm -hmm. um, it actually gives them a nasal infection and it'll just like blow up and eat up the top of the skull. So this should just all be flat and actually it just, this big bulge that was all being eaten away by the infection. It's mostly hobby, you make a little bit of money with it, but it's something for me that's fun to do in my spare time. You can find El Cheapo on Facebook, and if you look at his rates, he's pretty reasonably priced as his name implies. Here is my bear skull today, halfway through the degreasing process. I'll be sure to show it off here in a few months once it's complete. That's all for tonight, and I hope to see you right back here next week for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.